George Washington University, Paul Bagala, and Tucker Carl. Good evening and welcome to Crossfire tonight. Big Brother says it's time to lose weight. Also, the man who says the Clinton administration treated the White House worse than college freshmen checking out of their dorm rooms. <laughs> but first, praise the Lord and slam the other guy. This week's annual gathering of the Southern Baptist Convention has provoked cries of Muslim bashing. Monday, the Reverend Jerry Vines said, quote, Islam was founded by Muhammad, a demon-possessed pedophile who had 12 wives, and his last one was a nine-year-old girl. Vines added, quote, Allah is not Jehovah. Jehovah is not going to turn you into a terrorist that'll bomb people. The Southern Baptist Convention's new president refused to repudiate Vines' comments, calling them, quote, accurate. Muslims are calling, among other things, bigoted and hate-filled. Islam is an anti-Christ religion that intends through violence to conquer the world. The fact is that America was founded, I'm going to stagger you right now, America was founded in part with the intention of seeing this false religion destroyed. Muhammad received revelations from demon spirits, not from the living God. America has historically understood herself to be a bastion against Islam in the world. Well, let's pray uh, back to God some of what we find in the epistle to the Colossians, which I began reading and reflecting on this morning. This is a prison epistle of Paul written from prison to those in the city of Colossae. This was a city he'd never visited. Those who were part of his inner circle had taken the gospel to Colossae. He'd never been there. They had never seen him, so he's writing to people that he loves, but he has never seen. And notice how he opens the epistle. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Now, you notice that's customary for Paul to do that. When he begins a letter, he always says, we thank God. He just doesn't say, we thank God, when we pray for you. He says, we thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why did he add that? Because he wants to tell us the God to whom he is praying. Remember, the Romans had all kinds of gods. They had all sorts of gods. They had temples to a veritable plethora of gods. And Paul says, I want you to know which God I am praying to. I am praying to the God who is the Father of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm praying to that God. I'm not praying to Jupiter. I'm not praying to Saturn. I'm not praying to Job or Jove. I'm not praying to Mercury. I'm not praying to Hermes. I am praying to the God who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So by the way, that tells us very clearly, that's proof that Christians and Muslims do not worship the same God. This is something that no Muslim could ever say no Muslim would ever say, we always thank Allah, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because to them it is blasphemy to think that Allah could have a son. So clearly this indicates that Christians and Muslims do not, in fact, worship the same God. Allah is a demon God, because the only alternative to the true and living God is to have a false and counterfeit God who ultimately represents the Prince of Darkness. Now, where does this information come from? For this little booklet, I see that there is a constant reference to a book written by a certain Dr. Robert Morey, a book entitled The Islamic Invasion. So I went and got his book to find out what is happening here. What is he saying in that book? Where is his evidence? And in fact, after he had written The Islamic Invasion, a couple of years later, that uh, scholar wrote this book the moon god Allah in the archaeology of the Middle East. And this is where he puts forward his argument in a more concise and uh, in fact more persuasive manner. He gives archaeological evidence. Again, if you look at his book, you think that everything here you know, is well documented. He gives you pictures of archaeological discoveries of the ancient moon god. He gives you maps, drawings, illustrations. So one who reads this becomes convinced. Look at his footnotes. His footnotes are all well-referenced pages of it. So one thinks that 
all of this material is Sahih. But then, when I actually go through the material and I look at the books that he's quoting from to prove his case, I see that he's quoting from this book, Islam by Caesar Farah. I see that he's quoting from uh, Alfred Guillaume's Islam. So I go out and I buy the books myself. So I can check these quotations and see where these ideas are coming from. And when I check these books, I see that the man quotes one thing and the sources from which he quotes usually say the other thing. For example, he quotes from uh, Caesar Fira's book just one sentence. The sentence he quotes is this, there is no reason therefore to accept the idea that Allah passed to the Muslims from Christians and Jews. Now that's the sentence he quotes and that's the point he wants to prove. He wants to prove that the Allah that Muslims worship is not the God of the Bible. So what does he find? He finds a convenient quote right here which says there is no reason therefore to accept the idea that Allah passed to the Muslims from Christians and Jews. But that's not everything this author has said. If we take the entire paragraph which begins on the previous page it says, Allah, the paramount deity of pagan Arabia, was the target of worship in varying degrees of intensity from the southernmost tip of Arabia to the Mediterranean. To the Babylonians he was ill, God. To the Canaanites and later the Israelites he was El. It's very important. To the Israelites he was El. In other words, we're talking about the same God of the Bible. The South Arabians worshipped him as Ilah, and the Bedouins as Al-Ilah, the deity. With Muhammad he becomes Allah, God of the worlds, of all believers, the one and only who admits of no associates or consorts in the worship of him. Judaic and Christian concepts of God abetted the transformation of Allah from a pagan deity to the God of all monotheists. There is no reason therefore to accept the idea that Allah passed on a pass to the Muslims from Christians and Jews. You see, when you read the whole passage, you get such an entirely different understanding than what this man is quoting, that it makes you wonder, is this man writing as a Christian? Or what is he writing as? Because the Christian friends that we have, that we live among, that we work with, that we go to school with, uh, show us a, a different approach towards their understanding of Islam or their willingness to learn about Islam. You must have found that from your own experience. People out there uh, are willing to learn if we will just give them the right message. A different approach is taken by this Christian author, John Gilchrist, in his book entitled Our Approach to, Our Approach to Islam, Charity or Militancy. Now I'd like to refer to a relevant section in his book where he deals with this whole question as to whether or not Allah of the Muslims is the same as the God of the Bible. And in a nutshell he says that although we have different understandings of him, really Muslims and Christians are speaking about the same God. I'd like to read for you for some of his uh, writings first hand. He writes on page 20, The Christian writers who endeavor to distinguish between the Allah of Islam and the God of the Bible invariably concentrate on what Allah is not. He is not the father of Jesus Christ. He is not triune. He has no son, etc. Rarely is there an evaluation of who Allah in Islam really is. It would seem to be logical, before we express ourselves in convenient denunciations, to inquire what the Qur'an actually teaches about Allah and how He is defined in that book. Firstly, it is quite apparent from the Qur'an that the name Allah did not originate with Muhammad. The pagan Arabs openly acknowledge that beyond their various deities and idols, there was one supreme being who was the ultimate source of all things. If you should ask them who created the heavens and the earth and subjected the sun and the moon, they would surely reply, Allah. 
Uh, Surah 29, verse number 61. When faced with disasters, they cry unto Allah. Surah 10, verse number 22. And they also swear their strongest oaths by Allah. Surah 16, verse number 38. Western scholars agree that the name has pre-Islamic origins and that it is almost certainly derived from the Syriac Christian Allah. You see, and I can go on and on just to show you that the information is there for one who wants to find that correct information. But uh, the author on whom this comic book depiction de uh, depended obviously is not there looking for the truth. He has found something that he feels he can use in a convincing manner to persuade Christians to do not listen to Muslims and what they have to say. Now there is a reason for this approach and John Gilchrist himself in the book I last referred to explains why he thinks that other Christian writers are not taking the approach that he has taken in trying to describe Islam as it is. Why is it that many Christian writers, not only the man whose garbage I'm trying to now remove, but other Christians as well have tried to show that Allah is not the God of the Christians. That Muslims are talking about a different God, about a pagan God. Sometimes they try to depict that Muslims are worshipping a black stone and so on. The reason for this according to John Gale Christ is that these writers think that Islam is a threat from within. The reason for this, according to John Gale Christ, is that these writers think that Islam is a threat from within. I want you to understand that point. In other words, if Hindus say that Christians are worshipping something incorrect, or they don't believe right, nobody has to listen to them. But if Muslims say this, that message can have an impact. One key reason for that is that Islam has continued the faith in Isa alayhi salam, has continued the faith in the God of Isa alayhi salam, has continued the faith in Musa alayhi salam and Ibrahim alayhi salam. So that when we speak about religion, we're basically speaking about the same religion which Allah revealed to all of His prophets. In other words, we are pulling the carpet from under their feet. It's not that they have one and we have another one. It's just that we have come along and we have said that look, what you guys thought you have, you don't have because we have it. So we have become a challenge from within. And since they cannot answer our arguments, what they have decided to do now is to try and place us without. So we're not, no longer within the same Abrahamic faith. We have not inherited the same traditions. We did not continue the same beliefs. And the way to do that is to start with the God that we worship. They think that if they can convince the Christian public that the God we worship is a different God, then every Christian should rather stay far away from us because you know that's the way of the shaitan. We've got to be clear of that. That is what they want to accomplish by this particular tactic. But, of course, we are now in an information age. Such a tactic is bound to backfire. Information will be checked. Quotes will be studied. References will be cross-referenced. And if one uses deception in order to promote what he thinks to be true, that is only going to fly back into his face to his own shame.